sometimes I get ahead of myself, and that's something I've apparently been doing for the last two years. It's a term I've used repeatedly in the show without ever really explaining it. Outlier. It's a word sociologists use to explain a data point that falls outside, far outside sometimes, the standard deviation. AKA, that weird guy in the trench coat and Santa hat. Outliers appear everywhere, and they've cropped up a handful of times in my reviews. I've compiled a list of the reviews that prominently feature outliers, and it's literally all of them. It's kind of astounding. And yet, Psycho's list somehow remains outlier-free. What a lucky guy. Society has known about outliers since the invention of by invitation only, and has used several different monikers to refer to these individuals throughout history. However, one term still stands the test of time as a tried and true testament of one status within society. She's a witch! Yeah. Classics are truly timeless. A word originating in the 9th century, witches have a long, proud tradition of being falsely labeled and executed in horrendous ways. While some people did actively practice Wicca, many were just outspoken women that deviated from the standard behavior of the era, which was heresy, betrayal, and evil. So many words with the same meaning. We don't understand you, therefore, we fear you. While the number of people being burnt alive has decreased in recent years, at least on this continent, that doesn't stop societies from staring down their nose at those that fail to follow accepted norms. It's fairly common practice for the elite to decide who is in or out of a community through snubbing. With that in mind, let's talk about the Witches of Eastwick. A film from 1987 starring Moonstruck, Catwoman, and Franco's Cougar, it shows these three women in a Stephen King setting, complete with a strange storm in a New England hamlet, a slick man that's probably the devil, and uncomfortable sex. It's a great family film. So without further ado, let's introduce our unlucky bachelorettes. Announcer, take it away. Thank you, Socio. Love your shirt today. Bachelorette number one, Alex, hails from an artistic background and the most unconventional houseboat ever constructed. I mean, look, it's just a house built on the river. How crazy is that? Her husband passed away like Disney parents, without much fanfare. Suki, bachelorette number two, has a child herding business, which she populated with her own offspring. She's a spiritually sensitive writer whose husband deserts her after giving her a thousand children. Last but not least, we have Jane. Our unlucky number three is a musician wound so tight that she makes Psycho look relaxed. She teaches elementary school band when not being divorced by her husband. Which of our lucky contestants will make a deal with the devil? Dude, spoiler alert! Sorry. These women may or may not become involved with the devil. Back to you, Socio! You're sticking to commercials from now on. Darn. These women live in the small community of Eastwick, complete with small-town pride and a tight-knit web of rumors and judgment. All three have a decent standing within the town, but they're at a turning point in their lives now that they're suddenly single. That's why they go wild and meet at Alex's house on Thursday nights to talk about their dream man over drinks. Woohoo. That's the catch-22 of single. You're technically allowed to see whoever you want, as long as they're also single, but you might suffer social penalties if you take full advantage of this, especially if you choose the wrong person. Speaking of the wrong guy, meet Daryl Van Horn, the snoring monster. He's the new playboy in town, using his wealth to buy historical houses and renovate them to hold all of his pianos. He's crude, vulgar, and slimy as an eel. Also, he's impossibly fun to watch. Daryl represents the fun side of being bad. He owns his vile nature and flaunts it, bad to the bone and damn cool by default. The ultimate outlier. So it only makes sense that he'd go after the three other statistical anomalies. Daryl gets close to each one of them, giving, as he puts it, his girls, a new haven to gather, protected from the rumors spreading around the town about his involvement with them. This hearsay originates from a very vocal selectman, Felicia. She's the town's heart of gold and sees Daryl as a snake in their Garden of Eden. To be fair, though, he does introduce himself like this. Daryl Van Horn. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. So unfortunately for Felicia, Daryl has a trick or two up his sleeve and has just the people to help enact them. You see, the witches of the title are actually our three leads here. They just don't realize they're real witches yet. He does, and he gets them to... Well, watch. I wish you'd just go away. Have another cherry. Yeah, I'm as confused as you are. The magic's very vaguely defined, so let's bring in our own robe-clad expert on all things magic. All right. We'll go through this one more time. Please pay attention. This is timeout. This is obfuscate. This is casting a spell. This is auspex. 
This is I have inner character turmoil, and this is trying to seduce someone. Arr, Any questions? Um, why are we LARPing again? Because shut up. Arr, what's this gesture mean? Uh, that gesture means you have a terrible pirate accent, and you're flipping me off. Arr. Hey, I have a question about magic for you. Oh, you do this. I meant in the Witches of Eastwick. Hmm. Well, now I just feel stupid. Magic is a tricky thing to portray in movies, because it usually tends to go one of two ways. It's either too subtle or too blatant. Like superhero powers, witchcraft just needs enough to impress the audience without, you know, making every situation a cakewalk. The witches have that unbreakable story arc when they start doing things little by little and discover that not only do they have these witch powers, but they've apparently had them for some time. How does someone not notice that they and their friends can bend reality? So, have you ever gone out drinking with friends? No. Have you ever gone out at all? Nope. Then what do you do with all your time? I mean, you never show up for- you know what? It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll just explain. Before, what little time they did get together was probably at a social function, usually with their husbands and all sorts of other people, and probably large amounts of drinking. So therefore, any distortions of reality that could be perceived could simply be chalked up to, that was really weird, or, hey, I think I've had too much to drink. I should probably sit down now. So they all have blinders on themselves when it comes to magic. Well, yeah, but realize, to most adepts, strange things happen to them all the time. So to them, it's not strange, it's just normal. You know, it's usually when an outside perspective comes in, then they can put all the pieces together and see the big picture. Oh, speaking of pictures, have I shown you Cosmos yet? Cosmos. Like the magazine? Uh, so, this is what I'm talking about when I mean powers. Powers? Like, like what? You just transported me a book across time and space. Well, yeah, I do that all the time. Cool pictures of Mars. You never wondered how you could do that? Do what? Ah, never mind. Venus! Adepts have rudimentary understanding of their abilities, which only grow with time and study. That's why they should become even more of a force when they spend time with Daryl's Dark Tome of Magic. He really needs to put that in a better place. I mean, I know where mine is. It's on the bookshelf, next to Greed. That illustrates some magic used here well. Thanks, DM. No problem. Now, if you excuse me, I need to get back to teaching these guys these gestures. All right, and here we have the Big Dipper from the side. Mind blown. So, when the power of three is realized, they form a little family unit with Daryl. This, of course, has no consequences within the community. Are you buying the paper or not? Um, slut. What did you say? You heard her. Man, women can be vicious to each other. I wonder how different the movie would have been if it were some guys that summoned the woman of their dreams instead. Oh. Okay, some differences, but ultimately the same. Yes, because men and women are exactly the same. Hello? Hello there! Who are you? Is that really how you want to introduce a new character? Here. Try this. Yes, men and women are exactly the same, like you and me. Wait, you're not me at all. Oh, that is better. Much. So I take it you have an opinion on this matter. I'm on the internet, aren't I? While equal treatment is the message preached today, men and women will always be held to different social standards by one another. It's not only reinforced by nurturing, but by nature too. Statistically, you're right, but that's on small level things, like interactions with friends and family. And that constitutes how much of the average person's life? Average person? By what variables? While a job or some other nonsense can take up a large portion of one person's time, you don't often see pictures of co-workers littering a person's living room, unless they're friends, too. So these micro-level interactions do tons to shape the daily lives of every person, unless you're a hermit. And with the advancement in technology, there's more downtime than ever to enhance these casual connections and really make them important small facets of our lives. You have the strangest way of saying, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. So back on topic, how much difference can there be between being male and female in society? Have you ever been forced to smile and encourage everybody to have a good time, despite the fact that part of your body is trying to curl up on itself and drop out of your- Whoa, whoa, biology, got it! Didn't need the picture! Wow! That's just part of it. 
All three women in Witches of Eastwick show a distinct challenge of being a woman, especially a recently single woman. Suki herds her kids around without any help except from her also single friend. Jane is forced to bite her tongue when her employer makes a very forward pass at her just because her divorce was finalized. And Alex pursues her artistic passion even as the world ignores her. Life before Etsy was hard. Do you notice how all three women are in a bind of some sort? And they need help from the surrounding community in a lot of ways, but no one seems interested in helping them besides other women that are in the same situation. Why is that? Because they all do it with a smile. As long as she's smiling, a woman is okay. And she's trained to smile all the time, all her life. Be open, be inviting, be friendly. To not have her smile on, she better be having a real hard time. Not something small like desertion, divorce, or death of a husband. Wear that smile and the world can still keep going. Why would anyone keep smiling through all that? Well, at least they're still alive. <laughs> That's the rationalization, anyway. So women are emotionally aware creatures that force a false emotion to the forefront in many to most social interactions? Creatures? How can they stand it? Creatures? It explains a lot, actually. Pent-up outbursts, the occasional fits of crying. No offense meant. It's just... It just makes too much sense when you put it that way. What are you doing? Working towards a pent-up outburst, I guess. Okay, okay. I may have gone a bit too... <laughs> you wouldn't. I've got plenty more. Do you really want to go down this path? No, ma'am. Continue. That whole creatures thing is part of the problem. While we're different in what society expects from us and how we interact with one another, women are not an alien species. We just tend to carry many loads for those we care about, sometimes to a fault. That's why when we get a great opportunity to let someone in who understands that, we take it. Well put. Um. What was your name again? It's... Oh, pie's done. Thanks for having me. Who was that woman? So, the three witches are happy in their new family arrangement. Except for the disapproving outside influences. But how did they become one big happy family? Daryl played the game with each one of them. Quite masterfully, too. He's obviously a bad guy from the start and makes no promise to them outside the passion of the moment. Yet, despite his overtly crude behavior and total disregard for the community, he manages to seduce all three of them in record time. How does he do it? It's psychology, you dolts! Psycho? God, everyone's in this episode. Kelvin said you fled the state. Yes, he made sure to ruin that plan. Oh, so he's with you then. They'll kick him out eventually. Anyway, Daryl utilizes a combination of psychology and body language to expedite his expedient goal. Expedi- exp- Huh? Just watch this. The plight of women in this hemisphere is deplorable. I can bench press 800 pounds. You, me, and Coltrane till dawn. Giggity, 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 giggity. That's Daryl through and through. Oh, wait, did you just use a Family Guy clip on my show? I had to make you understand the point somehow. Lowest common denominator seemed a good starting point. Mr. Van Horn, with the very Freudian last name, plays the part of a dense, typical man very well, complete with disregard for anyone's interests other than his own. But when he lifts this veil to show that he does understand a woman's plight, he suddenly becomes an ideal. The insightful bad boy. It also helps that he read this while waiting for his flight at gate 9. It's a real page turner. So Daryl's approach is based on a formula. Well, he is a result of a formulation of all the traits that the witches want, so it only makes sense. When Daryl puts his worst foot forward with Alex, he does it to bring up her barriers, which she's completely used to doing. It's only after she's spent her defenses that he finally starts whittling away at her arguments, piece by piece, exploiting the common plight of women to get her into bed. The worst part is, this works on every woman! Um, be mindful of word choice here. Jane is opened up by his lecherous demeanor in a cello lesson. Suki is taken by the fact that he's not afraid of getting her pregnant. Not... Okay, seriously, that's all it takes. A man with confidence, speaking clearly with the slightest hint of what's going on in a woman's mind, could have any woman he wants in a New hey, York... Psycho. Do you feel nauseous? No, not... <laughs> Thanks for cutting him off. You're welcome. Want some pie? Well, what kind is it? Cherry. I'll pass. So, after the cherry puking fiasco, our women try to take a break from Daryl. 
This is when the darker side of getting what you want starts to show. Van Horn is a being of passion, and when he doesn't get what he wants, he gets passionately furious. He doesn't hate them, he's just selfish. A petulant child that cares deeply about spending every waking moment with the women he loves. What's wrong with that? I love you. I don't even know what love is. I could learn. This is Domestic Violence 101. Thankfully, unlike women trapped alone with no recourse against their oppressor, Alex, Suki, and Jane have each other and waste no time when it comes to escaping him. That support is a huge help in real partner abuse situations, too. When he tells one of them that she'll only be happy with him, she just needs to look to the side and see her friend's eyes conveying an entirely different message, that these three will always have each other's backs. They don't need the town, they just need each other for support. That's the message this film succeeds at. Even if mainstream society ostracizes a person, that doesn't mean there aren't groups out there that understand life on the outside. There's a community for everyone, and with the connections made through these structures, people have the means to make it through any situation. Even breaking up with the devil. Also, this movie is hilarious, dramatic, and all sorts of dark. So if that sounds like your thing, check it out. In the meantime, I have to floss. I like how it's damn stuck in my back teeth. I'm the other socio, and I'm never eating cherries again. I was round when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Me damn sure the pilot washed his hands and sealed his face. Shouldn't have had so many cherries. <coughs> Just couldn't stop eating them though. <sighs> Time for some cherry pie.